we'll start the, la the final uh, talk of our inaugural uh, virtual science conference. It's my pleasure to introduce Steve Gervin from uh, Yale, where I also uh, work. It's, uh, it's, it's, and uh, he'll be telling us about how to use uh, harmonic oscillators to encode quantum information. Steve, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. And um, people often uh, thank the organizers. This is an unusual thing, so I really want to give a special thank you to the to the organizers. And I'm sorry it was not sort of necessary, but uh, hopefully I will um, be able to make this work. So the, the, this was um, an invited talk for Tuesday in the physical review session. So it's supposed to be very uh, general and um, for a very broad audience. So I hope that's either appropriate or if it's too low a level, uh, I apologize. So I'm going to be talking about circuit QED, uh, which is a sort of microwave electrical circuit analog of cavity QED, which I'll talk about. And how um, rather than storing quantum information in superconducting, ordinary superconducting qubits, we're going to store the information in harmonic oscillators and manipulate that information using what other people uh, call the qubits. So um, let's remind ourselves about quantum electrodynamics. It's the theory of electrons and atoms coupled to the quantized electromagnetic field. And for a long time in optics, um, you know, the, you, could, you could have a semi-classical story about quantized atoms and semi-classical electromagnetic field, but there are important effects that you can only see because of the quantization of the electromagnetic field, which causes photon energies to be discrete, photon numbers to be discrete, and causes zero-point fluctuations of the vacuum, electric and magnetic fields. So the first and most important effect, which can only be explained by the quantization electromagnetic field, is the irreversible spontaneous decay of the excited state of an atom, such as the 2p state of hydrogen, in which the electron falls to the 1s state and irreversibly emits an ultraviolet photon in a time that takes about one nanosecond. Other effects of the vacuum fluctuations are, you know, renormalization of the electron mass um, due to virtual photon emission and reabsorption, and related effects, which such as the lamp shift, which lifts the degeneracy between the 2s and 2p orbitals, uh, which is otherwise exact in the absence of these uh, vacuum fluctuations. Cavity QED is <clears throat> the subfield in which you attempt to uh, modify the spectral density of vacuum fluctuations by um, trapping the vacuum and, and photons between mirrors and having discrete electromagnetic modes instead of a continuum of modes. So in the Let's see if I can grab the annotate spotlight here. <clears throat> so in the lower, <clears throat> sorry, lower left corner, you see an example of a cavity QED setup in which atoms are dropped through uh, a Fabry-Perot resonator, uh, which is a resonator at optical frequencies made of highly reflecting mirrors. The atom's spontaneous emission lifetime can become a little shorter because it can resonantly emit photons into this uh, wrapped mode if the frequencies line up. But if the frequencies don't line up, there's not much effect. The atom can still spontaneously emit in many directions, not uh, confined by the mirrors. 
I'm going to be talking about microwave cavity QED and circuit QED, where effectively the box is, uh, has mirrors on all sides. That, that's a superconducting uh, resonator that prevents the photons from escaping for a very long time. And we'd like to understand what happens to atoms and their spontaneous emission when they're in this special environment. And one thing it does for us in circuit QED, unlike three-dimensional cavity QED, is that it can extend the lifetime for spontaneous decay of our superconducting qubits by a factor of a thousand, provided that the cavity modes have different frequencies than the atom. <clears throat> uh, okay, now my slides are not advancing. Uh, hmm. uh, there we go. So here is uh, uh, an example of microwave cavity QED done with Rydberg atoms in the uh, Paris group. Uh, atoms, circular Rydberg atoms are sent through this microwave resonator and then interact with the photons and um, they don't detect the state of the photons, they, they detect the state of the atoms that have passed through the field and you can see uh, Robbie flapping between the 50th and 51st uh, Rydberg state, for example. Uh, in other setups, <clears throat> you do uh, optical uh, cavity QED and you measure not the state of the atoms after they've fallen through because they decay in a nanosecond or so, but rather uh, the state of the photons after they've interacted with the atoms. So we're going to do something more like this but uh, in the microwave domain. So circuit QED is the uh, superconducting electrical circuit analog of cavity QED. <clears throat> we have microwave photons trapped inside superconducting circuits, and we have not real atoms, uh, but artificial atoms, Josephson junction qubits, that we build that are very large, have an enormous dipole moment, and interact strongly with these photons. So we can get kind of ultra strong photon atom coupling and do nonlinear optics in a re completely new regime, very far, much stronger coupling than you can normally achieve at optical frequencies. We can get nonlinear effects at the level of one and two photons. So here's uh, a comparison between uh, a real atom, hydrogen, drawn not to scale, but 10 to the minus 10 meters in size. Uh, it has a 1s to 2p transition of a couple of petahertz, uh, a lifetime, as I mentioned, for spontaneous emission of about 1.6 nanoseconds. The Q for that transition, the frequency, angular frequency times the lifetime, is a few million. And the transition dipole moment is about a Debye. You know, it's on the scale of um, an electron angstrom or an electron uh, Bohr radius. On the right, you see a superconducting oscillator or qubit circuit. Its scale is much larger, a millimeter. <clears throat> the current is, uh, the, it's a superconducting circuit. The electrons are sloshing back and forth together passing through this chosen junction, which makes it into an artificial atom. The frequency is a few gigahertz. It's in the microwave. The uh, lifetime uh, is uh, 50 to a few hundred microseconds. The Q is, uh, in the best cases, uh, of order a million, similar to hydrogen. But the transition dipole moment is 30 million Debye because it corresponds to several Cooper pairs of electrons moving a millimeter. So the, the coupling of this device 
uh, to microwave photons can be orders and orders of magnitude larger than you can achieve with ordinary atoms. And this is where, this is what allows us to have remarkable control of the light matter system. So uh, here's a picture of the uh, now widely adopted transmon qubit, our artificial atom. It's basically a, um, <clears throat> a, um, a dipole antenna with, um, with, um, Two, two pieces of superconducting aluminum here, about a millimeter long. <clears throat> and the two halves of the antenna are connected by a Josephson tunnel junction, which is sort of the transistor of quantum computing. It's a small uh, tunnel junction, a few thousand atoms on a side, and uh, makes this circuit into effectively an LC resonator with a nonlinear inductor, an inductor whose inductance depends on the current flowing. And therefore, it's not a harmonic oscillator. It's softer than that because of the cosine potential of the superconducting order parameter phase difference. And you see uh, transition frequency for zero to one might be five gigahertz and one to two might be 4.9 gigahertz. And that anharmonicity allows you to have frequency selectivity to operate only on the two lowest levels. This is an artificial atom with an atomic number of about 10 to the 12. You might think that's a crazily complex spectrum, but in fact, because of um, superconductivity, the uh, electrons are moving coherently back and forth. And this is a, um, it gaps out all the single particle fermionic excitations and the quantized energy level spectrum is that of an anharmonic oscillator, much simpler than hydrogen, no fine structure, no hyperfine structure. And the quality factor, as I mentioned, is comparable to that of hydrogen. So, but the transition, enormous transition dipole moment, which comes about because we build these atoms with their own antennas to talk to the microwaves, gives us this ultra strong coupling, which is uh, uh, how we control everything. And we call this circuit QED. <clears throat> so here's an example of an artificial atom in a cavity. And you're looking at the spectrum of the atom. The, the uh, horizontal axis is the frequency of microwaves you apply to try to excite the atom, and the vertical axis is the probability that the atom uh, jumped from the ground to the excited state when you apply that frequency. And you see not one peak, but many peaks, uh, each one uh, depending, the position, depending on how many photons are in the cavity. And this arises from this so-called dispersive coupling, the third term in the box here on the right. You have the first term is the, the harmonic oscillator that represents the photons in the resonator. I'm approximating the transmon as a two-level system. So this is a spin a half Hamiltonian. And then the, the dipole coupling is not effective in first order perturbation theory because the, we've intentionally detuned the atom from the, uh, from the cavity. But in second order perturbation theory, you get this third term on the right with coefficient chi, which is the dispersive shift. And here you see the frequency of the atom when there are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 photons in the cavity. And it's uh, discrete, and uh, if you don't power broaden the lines, they're separated by about 3,000 line widths. So that's a really strong coupling. And what you learn from looking at this graph is that microwaves, despite their name, are actually particles. They're photons, perfectly good photons, the same as 
optical photons just having 100,000 times less energy. And this ability to count and detect and actually Q and D detect the presence of microwave photons is a new way to do uh, axion dark matter searches that um, are actually being put into place uh, here at the Haystack experiment at Yale as we speak. So this dispersive Hamiltonian also gives us universal control. I can send in a, a microwave signal at this frequency, which will excite or de-excite or rotate the, the um, transmon qubit uh, if and only if this is on resonance. And it's only on resonance if there are exactly two photons stored in the microwave cavity. This, this signal is at the qubit frequency. These two photons are at the resonator frequency. So you can do a qubit a photon state or cavity state dependent control of the qubit and vice versa, it turns out. So this gives us universal control of the combined system. Here's an example of that universal control. Uh, we start with uh, a resonator shown here on the left. We drive the resonator through one port. We drive the transmon through another port with these uh, funny wiggly signals that are shown in blue and red underneath the center panel. And uh, those are numerically determined from solving the, by uh, optimal control theory, solving the Schrodinger equation. And we start, and you see in the center pa um, top panel with the red curve, uh, zero photons in the cavity. And at the end of the pulse sequence, uh, you end up with exactly six photons in the cavity. So we've done a unitary map from n equals zero to exactly n equals six, creating a non-classical state of microwave light in the cavity. On the right, <clears throat> you see the uh, Wigner function of the n equals six state. The Wigner function is a quasi probability distribution in um, phase space. The x axis is position, the y axis is momentum. And you see it's perfectly circularly symmetric. That's because the number of photons is definite, it's exactly six, and therefore the phase angle is completely uncertain. That's why that's circularly symmetric. And uh, this is kind of measurements are very difficult to do in ordinary quantum optics. The key enabling resource is to be able to measure the photon number parity without measuring the photon number. And again, that's doable because of the uh, ultra strong coupling that we have. So here's uh, Schrodinger cat state, some of the largest uh, coherence uh, superpositions. Uh, of a quantum system are uh, made this way. There's uh, the ion trap people can make similar sized ones now. And you see on the, on the, uh, on the right uh, here, uh, this is a blob. Uh, uh, Steve, yeah. Uh, we have a question from the audience. This is from Anton. Hey, Anton. Yeah, hi. Sorry, uh, I, uh, I think I missed it a bit. So uh, how does the ultra strong coupling enable this and what is the difference with the other quantum optics? So you said the parity measurement is enabled by the ultra strong coupling. Well, um, it's somewhat complicated, but I'll give you a short, um, let me go back to here. So <clears throat> suppose I sent tone, this is not how we do it, but a simple story would be, I send in a photon, at a bunch of photons at frequencies corresponding to 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 uh, uh, photons in the resonator, the, the, the frequency of the atom corresponding to an even number of photons in the resonator. If it flips the qubit, the transmon, I don't know which of the microwave pulses did that. I only know that there have to be an even number of photons in the cavity. And if it doesn't flip, I know it's odd. Does okay. that help? 
Yeah. 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 That's not actually yeah. how we do it, but it's morally equivalent. Mm -hmm. All right. And also a quick, a quick question about this slide. Uh, what is the fidelity of this uh, preparation procedure? Um, I don't remember the exact number, but if you look up, it's very high. If you look up in the, uh, let me get the pointer again. If you look right here, this is the number distribution in the cavity and you can't see any signal except at six. Okay, yeah, fair enough. So okay. I don't remember the exact number, but it's high. Mm -hmm. Okay, good question, thank you. Uh, so here's a, a Schrodinger cat. It's in two places at once in phase space. Uh, here's the coherent state minus alpha superposed with the coherent state plus alpha. Uh, you see that the, these are blobs, they're not points. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is uh, vacuum noise uh, appearing right before your eyes in this, directly in this data. Uh, in the center, you see the whiskers of the cat. These are the interference fringes whose phase uh, <clears throat> is determined by the fact that this is an even parity cat with a plus sign connecting minus alpha and plus alpha. You can use these very rapid uh, parity oscillations for quantum metrology of small displacements, much smaller than the zero point uh, uncertainty of the blobs. Uh, here's some icing on the cake uh, from Michelle Devere's group. This is a Schrodinger cat in 35 places at once in phase space. This is the Gattisman, Kataya, Presco uh, grid states that are used for bosonic quantum error correction. Uh, and this work uh, has been used to do quantum error correction close to the break-even point. And it follows um, uh, earlier work uh, the previous year from uh, Jonathan Holmes uh, group led by Krista Fleming uh, in an ion trap system. And this, um, this grid state has very interesting uh, translation properties and the trans non-commuting translations in phase space can be used to represent non-commuting Pali operations on a qubit. It's a really interesting system, but I will skip over the details and just show you the pretty pictures. Uh, we, we have another question from the yeah. This is from Yuna Kim. Uh, 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 there we go. I think your mic is on now. Ah, okay. What is the, the break even point? Oh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> when you, boy, <clears throat> losing my voice. When you, um, when you do quantum error correction, you have to store the information in many physical qubits, or in this case, many complicated photon states. And so you have more errors. Mm -hmm. And the error correction protocol has to be so efficient and fast mm -hmm. that you make up for those errors and you get back to the lifetime you would have had if you had just used a single qubit, or in this case, just used a single photon in the resonator. Without worrying about error correction. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if you have a code that has nine qubits, the error rate mm -hmm. is nine times higher. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you make that error correction nine times, you know, make it now, mm -hmm one ninth of nine, you get back to where you started. That's break even. I see, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So what can we do with these control capabilities? We can do quantum error correction, as I just mentioned, with various bosonic codes. The only, these are the only ones that have actually reached break even. The surface code work people are doing is still very far away. Uh, I'm going to show you some boson sampling simulations of molecular vibrational spectra. And someday in the future, we hope to do quantum simulations of interacting boson many body problems. For example, the bosonic fractional quantum Hall effect for where the bosons are microwave photons. 
Uh, but this is what I'm going to talk about as uh, one application here. So <clears throat> you can represent bosons using qubits, but it's not very efficient. It's much easier to use harmonic oscillators to represent harmonic oscillators. And we have microwave um, oscillators, resonators. And uh, we're going to use those to simulate, represent the vibrational states of triatomic molecules. And we're going to look at the, the two of the two of the vibrational modes of such molecules, um, as you see on the right, and represent the quanta of vibration, the phonons, as microwave photons. And we're going to uh, then uh, do a quantum simulation of the optical spectra and the vibronic sidebands of such a molecule. So I'll remind you about the Frank Condon effect that if I have, you see here, a, uh, a two-dimensional uh, configuration uh, space uh, showing the potential energy surface on which the atoms are moving. And when the el electrons are in the ground state, you have one surface. When, the electron when you send in an optical photon and excite the uh, electron from bonding to antibonding, you get a new surface, which is both squeezed, shifted, and rotated in this two-dimensional space. And uh, you end up with uh, uh, being in a variety of different excited states that give you a complex optical spectrum. The way we simulate that is through uh, a process in which we, if you look in the upper right uh, quantum circuit, we squeeze one cavity mode, we squeeze the other cavity mode, we do a beam splitter between them, which forms a linear combination of them. It rotates it in configuration space. We unsqueeze. We unsqueeze the other. We do displacements. And then we, that's performed the unitary transformation that maps you from one potential energy surface Hamiltonian uh, eigenspectrum to the other. And then we sample, we measure how many bosons are in each cavity. And from that, we deduce, as you can see here, the vibronic spectrum, the optical spectrum for photoionization of water and for ozone. So the potential energy surfaces were computed on a classical computer. Uh, we're only solving the dynamics of the motion on these complicated potential energy surfaces using our quantum computer that consists of these two um, uh, microwave resonators and their controller circuits. And the solid lines are the you know, exact results computed on a classical computer. And the, um, the cyan dots that are the sort of purpley dots um, near the top agree uh, extremely well with those. The difference in the distributions is um, has a, there's a fidelity of about 95%. And then there are some other dots, uh, red, which uh, were done by a different but more efficient method of sampling. And that <clears throat> I won't, don't have time to explain in detail but it's a quantum non-demolition measurement in one shot of eight bits of information about how many photons are in the two cavities. So four bits of information uh, telling you the binary decomposition of the photon number in the left cavity and the binary decomposition of the photon number in the right cavity. So instead of uh, among the 256 lines that are here, instead of saying, are you in line number 32, you know, and see how often the answer is yes, the answer is almost always no, so you don't gain a lot of information. But with this scheme, it samples from this probability distribution using true boson sampling, 
and tells you uh, which one occurred. So you get information every time. And of course, you sample from the stronger peaks more frequently. So it's, it's exactly what you do in an actual uh, optical experiment. So we're pretty excited about the hardware efficiency that we've achieved with this using bosons to simulate bosons because uh, while this is a small molecule and can easily be simulated on a classical computer, you cannot do this on today's uh, qubit-based computers. It would have required uh, a dozen or so qubits and a circuit depth of a thousand or so. And here, the, um, the operations that we needed to do on the bosons were quite, they're sort of native in this kind of bosonic processor, easy to carry out. Steve, okay. uh, we have a question Yeah, uh, from Xavier. Hi. Hi Steve. Um, just a quick question. This, this method of measuring uh, for bits simultaneously, is like a multi-pulse thing? Using several pulses at the same time or something like that? Say it again. So how do you measure these four plus four bits? I know you didn't want to explain, but is it like a multiplex kind of thing? <clears throat> so um, I told you before how we measure the photon number parity. That's right. So that's the, that's the bit B0. That's the first entry in the binary number. And uh, by similar clever techniques, you can do, this is called the phase estimation algorithm. You can measure um, whether, uh, once you know it's, let's say, even, then you want to know what is the photon number uh, mod 4. Is it zero or two? That tells you the next bit. Once okay. you know those two bits and you look at the uh, photon number mod eight and so forth, you, you can, uh, in log n steps, you can get, you know, what the number is. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. And it's Q and D. It's all done in one shot, uh, which is, you know, kind of bizarre. It doesn't eat up the photons or overly collapse the state when you make the measurement. Uh, there is a second question from IUCMP. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you can, IUCMP can introduce themselves. So hi, Steve, this is Gerard Ortiz. So uh, how, how, how much flexibility you have in the preparation of your initial state? So can you do the equivalent of important sampling? So, um, <clears throat> sorry. So, one thing that is good about this uh, and an advantage over um, optical, uh, ordinary optics uh, methods of doing this simulation is that uh, besides this ability to do true uh, number resolving sampling, is that we can prepare Fox states. I showed you an instance where we put exactly six photons in the resonator. So that would be preparing the sixth vibrational or seventh vibrational state, I guess, of the, uh, of the molecule in one of the modes. So we can prepare and um, uh, we can say, given a particular Fox state in the two, in the initial state, what is the distribution of Fox states in the final state? We could use that to uh, stochastically prepare a thermal distribution or other distributions, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I think I was basically at the end in terms of, uh, I didn't talk about error correction, but you know, there's a series of steps one has to do uh, to get up to fault tolerant computation, and there's um, you know quite a ways to go, but um, there's lots of interesting things happening with this um, technology. So I thank everybody for listening. All right. Um, so. We've already had some questions, and if there are any more, now is the time. Steve, you can see everyone is applauding you silently from the participants list. Maybe you can't see it, but uh, I'm looking. Okay, here we have a question from Anton. 
Anton, you're unmuted. Yeah. So um, I would like to understand better uh, what are the limitations here? You, you mentioned need to go by a factor of 10 more. What will it take to have to go by a factor of 10 more in the fidelity? Uh, so <clears throat> that was um, why the slide advanced on it. Okay. So, um, so this is for the question of uh, error correction. We, we, we reached break even and even went sort of 30% beyond, but you know, that's not, that was a lot of trouble. You'd like the lifetime to be 10 or 100 times longer, right? Because there's no such thing as too much coherence. Yeah, sure. So um, it turns out that error correction is fantastically difficult. Um, the qubits and the cavities are making errors and your measurements and controllers are making errors. And if they miss an error or they think there's an error when there isn't one, you can do damage. So uh, it's going to take um, better materials to increase the sort of physical qubit lifetime. It's going to take more clever um, uh, control methods uh, to do the, the search for the errors and, and feedback. The real problem here, the huge advantage of using uh, harmonic oscillators instead with many states instead of many qubits with many states is when you have many qubits to make your logical qubit, there are many physical locations where the error can occur and you have to find out where the error is. In a single mode oscillator, there's basically only one error. You lose a photon. And so it just turns out to be incredibly more efficient. And that's how we were able to reach break even. But we've got to do much better than that. And um, is, the, is the main source of, uh, so, so it's a photon loss that is the main limitation of the fidelity. Is that correct? Well, <clears throat> yes, but um, in order to make non-classical states of a harmonic oscillator, you need something in harmonic. You need that transmon qubit. Mm -hmm. And we like the oscillators because their lifetimes are 30 or 50 times longer than the transmons. But we can't live without the transmons. So we have to use these very um, much, you know, most of the errors are actually in the controller, not the thing being controlled. Oh. And it's a, real, it's a super big challenge to control a very good thing to make it even better using a not very good controller. That's our challenge. All right, yeah, I see. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, we have another question from Yuna Kim. Uh, Yuna, you're now unmuted. Yeah. Um, so with this simulation, um, it, the, this uh, three atom state, right? is something that can be simulated with classical computer. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so um, when would you be able to do something that cannot be done with classical computer? What's, what's stopping you from doing that? Right, um, so, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, the thing which is computationally complex is uh, you're gonna start with a uh, let's say a, uh, a Fox state, in, you know, zero or one bosons, just to keep it simple, among 50 modes. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to look at the output distribution. That mm -hmm. requires calculating the permanent mm -hmm. of the Green's function that tells you the amplitude that you go from mode A to mode B. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, determinants are uh, polynomially hard, permanents mm -hmm. are exponentially hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, I don't know the exact crossover point, um, mm -hmm. but it's probably, uh, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 modes at most. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a subtlety in that argument, which is permanents are exponentially hard to compute exactly. Mm -hmm. They're not that hard to compute to um, 
some additive precision. So you, mm -hmm. you don't do well on the very small peaks, but you do well mm -hmm. on the big peaks, which are the ones you can see anyway. Mm. So, um, you know, if you're a purist, uh, you have to worry about those kinds of things when describing the complexity mm. and claiming some quantum advantage. So, but at, at like 30, would you have quantum advantage? I don't know what is simulatable. I, I could imagine three is, but it's oh, yeah. what number, um, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, I don't know the exact number, but somewhere between uh -huh. 50 is, if I remember correctly, is the place I where see. people would have trouble. Uh -huh. uh, but truth be told, uh -huh. the really hard part of simulating molecular spectra uh -huh. is figuring out the potential energy surface, solving the fermion problem uh -huh. that determines that. Uh -huh. And uh, in principle, quantum computers can do that. Density mm -hmm. functional doesn't work very well because it's an excited state. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody is anywhere near close in a, on a, with a quantum hardware to you know, solve a, a fermion problem with precision. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, trying to be very honest here and <laughs> avoid uh, <laughs> a, very, a lot of hype, which, of which there is too much in this field. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, there is another question from IUCMP. You're now in Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, this is Bob Axelrod. Hey. So I was wondering, so these are artificial atoms. So yes. from, from, one, from one unit to the next, they're not exactly the same. What kind of, at least theoretical limitation does this put on, like, uh, you know, error correction yeah. schemes or, you know, how, how many qubits you can actually mm. address and so on. Right. That's an excellent question. So the nice thing about cesium is all the atoms are not just identical, they're literally indistinguishable. Uh, but um, all of our qubits are bespoke and, and uh, distinct. But it turns out that um, unlike with lasers, microwave sources are just amazing. And uh, we tend to, once you calibrate uh, the frequencies of transitions for all of the atoms, you can just dial those into a microwave generator to, uh, I don't know how many digits, but lots and lots of digits. And um, when you wanna make a transition from like a, like a flip-flop or XY, sigma plus, sigma minus transition from one move and excitation from one atom to another, and the frequencies aren't the same, you can attune a parametric process to kind of effectively bring them in resonance um, and to make sort of inelastic jump from one to the other. And that's tunable by frequency. So everything, all of these we typically work in a rotating frame where every single mode has zero frequency. And you just have to keep all your microwave tones locked together in phase. And there's an atomic clock that comes built into the source that does that for you. So they tell me it's okay and mildly complicated, but much easier than locking lasers together. Okay. So and it's not really a problem. Um. All uh, right, so I, I think we have one, uh, another question from uh, Xavier. Yes, uh, I muted myself. <laughs> no, wow. I have the right, so I did. Uh, my question is, uh, how many of these cavities can you put together to like, increase the size of these thing, simulations? Because as far as I remember, by talking with Chris, was that these cavities are big. Yeah, uh, they are a centimeter scale. Uh, although, as Rob Sholkoff always says, in a, you can get a cubic meter refrigerator, and in a cubic meter, there's a million cubic centimeters. So it would be a quality problem to run out of uh, <laughs> space from having that many uh, cavities. So um, Chris Wang is actually, uh, his next project is to scale this up to some larger number of 
coupled cavities. And I, I've seen a few CAD drawings where he's, um, I think he's aiming for half a dozen. And that'll be a general purpose bosonic simulator that can do uh, vibrations of molecules or many body where many is six <laughs> uh, body physics of uh, bosons interacting and traveling in a lattice. Okay, is it still below these 30 boson? Oh yeah, no, no, that's, uh, that's a ways off. Right, right. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. All right. And um, if there are no further questions, then I'll introduce Aliska, who will give our closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you again to Steve. My pleasure.